bless you. Amen. God bless you. Good. Look at your neighbor and say, get ready. All righty. Well, God bless you. Please be seated. Oh, man. What a day to be alive. It's the it's most crucial time in human history. And look who God's let live. I go, what are you thinking? Don't you think? And here, here's what he told me when I said, what are you thinking? He said, yes, I finally found me a people weak enough to work in. He said, not weak in character, not weak in morals, not weak in ethics, weak in their own ability. He said, I found me a generation that's embraced John 15.5. John 15.5 says what? Without me, you can do nothing. First time I ever read that years ago, oh, I got mad. I was reading long enough, without me, you can do nothing. I go, well, how dogmatic is that? What does he mean I can't do nothing? So then I chilled out and thought, well, Maybe I better look up the Hebrew word nothing. Back then, you had to get vines and weasts and big old thick books, and I'm looking for nothing. What nothing? What is nothing? I found it. Guess what nothing is? A big fat zero with the vacuum sucked in it. It's less than nothing. Without him, uh, it's less than nothing. But through him, by him, in him, we're unstoppable. I'll tell you what, I, I want you to know something. Uh, I want you to start having a, a bigger expectation. God can do anything. He can do anything with anyone. And he wants to move powerful and mighty. So some of you that don't know me, first experience I had with God was this. I was in my mommy's womb. It's 1943. My dad's dying in a mental institution from a venereal disease. And so the doctors tell my mother, the baby inside your belly will have the same disease killing his father. So my mom was, uh, she was desperate. Uh, she already had two children. One of them was born crippled, my brother. And so here's what my mom did out of mercy. She took a coat hanger, turned it into a hook, inserted it into her womb, and attempted to pull me out. So help me God, the hand of the Lord, that's in the Bible, he covered me in my mother's womb. He, the Lord pushed me aside and kept my mother from extracting my life out. Yeah, that's pretty wild, isn't it? That's, that's a good start. And here's what happened. Uh, I, I got born. Oh, boy. I've, I had some in, encounters. Good Lord. Uh, I, it's, it's, I, I don't know uh, much about how to describe what goes on with me, but it's pretty weird. I said, here, here we go. I'm a little bitty boy about like this, and I, uh, I was way too young to go to school, and I'm out in the front yard walking like this, and a voice spoke to me. Here's what the voice said. You ready? Don't get on the pony. I didn't know nothing about a pony. I didn't know. And it froze me when that voice said, don't get on the pony. I couldn't move. I was, I was frozen. And it said it again. Don't get on the pony. When I could move, I moved. I ran in the house, jumped in the bed, pulled the cover over my head. Then here comes my brother. He's crippled, and he's, he's walking on these crutches, and uh, he comes to the bed. He goes, what's wrong with you? I said, don't get on the pony. He goes, what pony? I don't know. And here's what happened. A few days after that, my mother gets some of her clothes. And by the way, uh, we didn't go to Walmart to buy clothes. The farmers gave my mother a feed sack. And she would, they, they'd empty out the feed sack, and they'd give the sack to my mother, and my mother would make our clothes. You know, isn't that something? That was poor. I mean, really poor. Uh, but anyway, uh, so a few days after that, mother put some of our clothes in a box, tied them up with a, 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 some twine. And here comes my uncle. He's driving a, 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 a new Mercury because he sold cars. And my mother puts some of our clothes in the trunk of that car, and we get in, and I, I, I thought, boy, this is something. I'd never been in a new car, and it smelled funny, you know. So we start driving, we drive, and we drive, and we drive, and uh, we stop to have a picnic. Now, this, this is a brand new territory for me, and uh, I noticed my mother was kind of sad during this deal, but anyway, we stopped and had a picnic, and I caught a, a flying squirrel, bit, the cr cr bit, bit me pretty hard, uh, you know, a little flying squirrel. But it bit me when, they, you know, uh, still got a scar. I'm mad at it. Still got a scar. Anyway. So anyway, finally we drive and drive and drive and drive and drive. And my uncle turns the blinker light on. And there's a, like a gate where you're going into a farm or something. Uh, and uh, he turns down it. And he drives. And he comes and pulls up to a little 
a fence there and stops. And here comes a lady with a pony. She's leading a pony. We come right to the back door of where we are, opens the door and says, Get on the pony, boys. Me and my brother slid all the way on the other side of the car and we started screaming, We ain't getting on the pony. We ain't getting on the pony. But see, that's how they took, that was an orphan's home, and that was how they take the children away from the parents is they put them on the pony and walk them off while the parents drive away. See, a little kid out in the front yard heard a voice that said, don't get on the pony, and, and, and kept our family from being fragmented. See, God, God is a wonderful God. And so anyway, my brother and sister went to school. Oh, I was mad as a wasp. That's the first time I'd ever been without a sibling to play with. My brother and sister went to school. Big old yellow school bus swallowed them up. Off they go. And I'm by myself. I'm mad. So guess what I decided to do? Run away! So I take off running. I run away from home because I don't have nobody to play with. It seemed like I went a mile, but that's probably 400 yards out, out in the field. Out under some big old trees. Giant trees. I'm a little bitty thing like this, and I'm mad. So I fell on the ground under the trees, put my face in my hands like this, and I said, well, I guess I'll have to just be by myself. All right, now here's what happened. When I said that, uh, a wind started in the field over there and got up in the top of the tree, the wind did, and a voice spoke to me out of the wind in the tree and said, no, Bobby, you'll never be by yourself. See, when he said, see, the Skies roll back. Just like that, the heavens roll back. I saw what I thought was horses on fire running back and forth. It was angels, but I'm a little kid from Texas. Looked like burning horses. But I thought everybody saw that. That, that boy said, no, you'll never be by yourself. See? So I thought everybody could see that. So when I got my brother and sister got home, some of the little friends came, and I told them, guess what? I can see into heaven. They mocked me, made fun of me, so I, I said to myself, I'll never tell another human being I can see in. But I can. I can see in the heavens. Heavens are real. Heavens are more real than here. You know that, don't you? Paul says what we see we can't see is eternal. What we see that we do see is temporary. And I'm telling you what, so uh, that's how I got started. I started when I was young. Uh, I'm 80 now. I've been preaching 56 years. Hey! Been been preaching 56 years. I've averaged speaking five times a week for 56 years. What? I've, do the math. Anybody got to calculate? I've, for, for 56 years, I've averaged speaking five times a week. I'll tell you what I am. I'm living proof. Practice don't make perfect. Hey, hey. You know. <laughs> so we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, don't you think? We're, we're in a big, big mess, but we've got a good God, and God's going to see us through. Uh, God's up there. He's author and finisher, not author and oops. You ever started something, have to go, oops. God's not that way. He finished it before he ever started it. I like what happened earlier while the people were down here. There was some real interchange going on. The old man was sliding out, a new fresh wind coming. Aren't you glad God wants to finish what he starts? Uh, listen, he that has begun a good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. I like that, being confident of this very fact. He that has begun a good work in us will continue it. Now, the Lord's been really, really doing some things, man. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of stories that have just happened to me. And uh, I was just over there in Denver, say Denver. I, I was somewhere up over there in Denver. And uh, it was pretty wild. Uh, we, we was having a conference, and it was, go, it was going nice and so uh, I'll get up that morning, and I'm sitting in a hotel, and I, 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 here's what I said. Lord, what do you mean to talk to your people about today? And he, uh, he said, I want you to teach them to hear the voice of God. I said, okay, you want me to teach the people to hear the voice of God? Yes. Give me a verse. And he gave me Psalms 30, Psalms 29, verse uh, 3. And so if, if you study Psalms 29, you'll find out a lot about the voice of God, the voice of the Lord. It's mentioned six or seven times right straight in a row here. But here, here, here I am now. Now remember, tell the truth in church. Don't exaggerate nothing. Here we go. I'm sitting, sit with me at the, at the hotel. I've got my Bible out. The Lord said, I want you to teach people uh, hearing the voice of God. I've, what verse? Psalms 29, verse 3. So here it is. I, had, I took this finger right here. 
and I leaned down to read it in my Bible, and it says in verse 3, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord is upon many great waters. When I read the Lord is upon the waters, guess what happened? Hey! Water began to bubble up through my Bible. A spring of water bubbled up. About this, it stood up about this high, right from that verse. You, you can feel my, you can feel it crumpled up the pages like this. I grabbed a napkin, I was drying it up like this. So I thought, boy, that's something. So I, I just uh, Morning Star Ministry, y'all know them down down in Charlotte. I've known Rick for thirty some odd, some odd years. I was just down there doing their round table, uh, prophetic round table, and so I thought, I believe I'll tell this the gang about what happened to me. I said, uh, about this water. So I tell them, I said, man, I had an experience the other day. Well, it's February the 17th. Uh, I, I had a real experience the other day. Uh, my Bible started a spring of water coming up through it. When I told them this, and just the moment I quit telling them, guess what happened? Water opened up and started pouring on my head from the, from the sky. Now, we're in Morning Star Ministries there, and there's old Stephen Strang, the guy that does a uh, Charisma magazine, and water's just. <laughs> I mean, listen, I like show and tell, don't you? Yeah, that's pretty wild. And it happened, and there's all these, every one of them in there saw it. The, the drops of water was big enough for people to see it. Now, I like that, don't you? It's a confirmation. Well, how do you know the Bible's true? Hey, try it out. I'm telling you, everything we need to live godly in this present world is confined in this book. It really is. So that was pretty good. Uh, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Amen. So anyway, uh, you can hear the voice of God. Matthew 13, 16 to 17 says, Blessed are your ears, for they hear. And it says, Blessed are your eyes, for they see. And so anyway, so you ought to start saying, I got blessed eyes, I got blessed ears. I can hear the communication from God. That's what he said, my sheep hear my voice. They follow, said they'll flee other voices. But anyway, the Lord has been telling me some pretty interesting things. One of the things that's really interesting to me, the Lord said to me, Bobby, I said, yes. He said, I want you to tell the people something. I said, okay, I'll tell them whatever you tell me to tell them. And he said, I want you to tell them I am preparing to answer the prayer Paul prayed in, in Colossians. I said, okay now. You're saying to me you're getting ready to answer the prayer Paul prayed in Colossians. He said, that's correct. Guess what I did? I jumped down in my Bible and I got to Colossians and uh, I looked at Paul's prayer. Now, I'm here to tell you, you better listen because there are some promises here that's going to cause your heart to pound. Here we go, Colossians chapter 1. And God told me, he said, tell the people, I'm preparing to answer this prayer that was prayed by Paul in Colossians chapter 1. They, there, there, there is an uh, entrance to it. The entrance to it is this. You've got to be wildly, zealously in love with the Holy Spirit. For anybody that's wildly, zealously burning in love with the Holy Spirit, that's, who's, that's who qualifies for this. Because Paul is getting word from Epaphroditus and, and that, that how uh, hungry the people were for the Holy Spirit. And so here, here it is. Uh, say Colossians. Chapter 1, starting with verse 8. He also informed us of your love in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a little weak. It means your burning, zealous love in the Holy Spirit. Did you know the Holy Spirit is not optional? We can't do a thing without him. He's, he's absolutely essential. Here we go. Uh, now, here's what God, he, God promised me. Bobby, I'm getting ready to answer this prayer. See if you want it. And he, he also informed us of your love in the Holy Spirit. For this reason... The love, your love in the Holy Spirit. We also, from this day we heard of it, have not ceased to pray and make special requests for you, asking that you might be filled with the full, deep, and clear knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and comprehensive insights into the ways and the purposes of God and in understanding and discerning of spiritual things. How many of you want that? Look at it. For this reason... Burning zealous love for the Holy Spirit. From the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and make special requests for you, asking that you may be what? Filled 
with the full, deep, clear knowledge of God's will with all spiritual wisdom, comprehensive insights into the ways and the purposes of God in understanding and discerning of spiritual things. Verse 10, that you might walk, live, and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him and desiring to please Him in all things, bearing fruit in every good season and in every good work and steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God with fuller, deeper, clearer insights and acquaintances and recognition. Verse 11, we pray that you may be what? What? Invigorated. Oh, that means strengthened from the inside out. I'll tell you, that's how you get, uh, I'm, listen, these, these people sniffing up dope and all that, they're trying to get invigorated. Right here, it, it, he will invigorate you, okay. Verse 11, and we pray that you may be invigorated, strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory to exercise every kind of uh, endurance and patience and perseverance with forbearance and with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us and made us fit to share, which is the portion of the inheritance of the saints, God's holy people. I want these, don't you? I, now, if you're zealously in love with the Holy Spirit, yeah, they, these are going to be for you, Okay. Understand more about the things of God. Oh, man, live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. I read a verse that messed me up for months. Here it is. You ready? Why it is God that works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. When that word good pleasure grabbed me, I mean, can you imagine the creature, Bobby, can do something to bring the creator good pleasure? Whatever that is, that's our highest quest. That's our most noble goal, isn't it? Why, it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What can the creature do that will bring the creator good pleasure? I like to tore the pages out of my Bible. I'm looking for what can the creature do that will bring the creator good pleasure. I found it in the Gospel of Luke. Here's what it says. Oh, shuddering, shivering little flock, do not be so timid. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Nothing thrills God more than finding a people he can give the kingdom to. The Bible said the eyes of the Lord are roving to and fro looking for people whose heart is upright towards him. You know what we should do? Psalms 110. Psalms 110 says uh, we should volunteer in the day of his power. So if he's looking more to say, hey God, don't strain your eyes right here in Eden. Here we are says we should volunteer in the time of his power. This is the time of his power, and we need to volunteer, don't you think? All right. You say, oh, Bobby, I, I, I just want to live a few good years and go on to glory. Listen, if the ultimate will of God was just get us from earth to heaven, we wouldn't need the functioning five pole. Guess what we need? Evangelist and assassin. <laughs> don't you think? But God leaves us here to establish the functioning fivefold ministry. I know. That, that's on TikTok. That, that little thing I just said. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. One time the Lord said, You amuse me, boy. Yeah. Uh, listen, yeah. You say, Well, what did the Lord say to you? He said, You amuse me, boy. Now, listen, don't lie. Uh, the Lord appeared to me and said, Bobby. He said, I want you to study Song of Solomon. And I said, as a good redneck, I don't get much in nothing out of that book. Now, that's about as ignorant as you can get. Almighty God, creator, says to you, for you to study a portion of his word, and you say, I don't get nothing out of that. Guess what he said the next word? So help me now. Here's his next word. You ready? You don't know nothing about kissing, do you, boy? I said, apparently not. And he taught me three things about mouth kissing. Jesus did. You say, oh, I want to. Listen. I, I said, I don't get nothing out of that book. He said, you don't know nothing about kissing, do you, boy? Apparently not. He taught me three things about mouth kissing. Number one, you have to be face to face. Number two, you have to be really close. Number three, mouth kissing is the most preparatory act before intimacy. And so, you see, the Song of Solomon says what? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth because his mouth is altogether lovely. Wow, isn't that something? Now, the Lord will do stuff like that. You say, well, Bobby, can you give us some of the experiences that you've had with the Lord? 
Here's one. Um, I preached on the cross hundreds of times, the cross of Christ. And this is a spring day, and uh, the, the, it's beautiful outside. The, the weather's nice. And uh, I'm, I'm inside my office, and I'm studying. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach the, the coming Sunday on the cross. And I'd preached on it so many times. And so there's my Bible and I open a uh, notepad. And so I'm pulling my chair up a little closer to the desk. And on the way, as I'm pulling it closer to the desk, I said this, Lord, make this more than mere words. Oh, man. When I said this, make this more than mere words, guess what happened? I'll tell you what happened. I was sucked up out of my office. I was thrown back 2,000 years in history, and I go to the cross with Christ. What? I was jerked up out of my office. I was shot back 2,000 years in history, and I find myself on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. I see a mob coming down the hill. It's Christ bearing his cross. I, my mind's working. I'm going, oh, this and here comes Jesus. He comes from here to this guitar from me, bearing his cross. And his eyes met my eyes, and all, and all the strength left. And wham, I hit the cobblestones, and I get up and go to the cross with Christ. And listen, that's, this is before Mel Gibson made his movie, The Passion of the Christ. So I, I wrote about this called The Cross. Churches bought them by the tens of thousands to give the book out to people coming to the movie. Listen, I got to see Mel couldn't capture the smells. Uh, the, the, the demons whirling, it says strong bulls have been compassed around me. See, Jesus didn't die from a spear or suffocation. He died from a broken heart. First time, only time you ever hear it is when he says, My God, my God, why has thou, why have thou forsaken me? Why, why, why do, see, he's not dying as a son, but a sinner. Why? He that knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And the Father is of a pure eye than to behold iniquity. So he had to turn. Isn't that something? That's, that, he died. It says in Psalms, my heart is melted within me. He died of a broken heart. Now I'm telling you, sin is costly, isn't it? Our sins. And the Lord Jesus took our place on the cross. But anyway... What a time to be alive. These are very, very important days. And here's another thing God promised me. You ready? Now, he won't lie to you. Uh, he, pro he said, Bobby. I said, yes. He said, go where I tell you to go. Do what I tell you to do when, I, when you get there. I'll give you an uh, uh, impartation for the people. And I said, okay, Bobby, go where I tell you to go. Do what I tell you to do when you get there. You're going to give me an impartation for the people. He said, that's correct. And he said, they're going to get it whether they want it or not. <laughs> what? I said, how can I tell them they're going to get it whether they want it or not? He said, you, yes, yeah, said you can get in an elevator with somebody and catch whatever they've got. And so you're going to catch an impartation. Romans 1 says, I yearn to be with you that I might impart to you a spiritual equipping. Psalms 92, 10, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. But here, here, here's what you're going to get. You ready? This is what he told me. I said, okay, what, a, what impartation are you going to give him? He said, out of Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21. You ready? I'll read it for us. Now may the God of peace, who's the author and the giver of peace, who brought again from among the dead the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood that sealed and ratified the everlasting agreement, the covenant, the testament. Here it is. Strengthen and complete and perfect and make you what you ought to be and equip you with everything good that you may carry out his will while he himself works in you, accomplishing that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ the Messiah to whom be glory forever and ever, ages without end. Amen. Make you perfect, it says. Give you everything you need. So I looked up the word make you perfect. Guess what it means? Missing no component. Everything you need, you've got. And I said, God, okay. So that's what you can expect to get tonight. And then you're going to be responsible. Be responsible for the anointing. I'm telling you guys, can you, let's look at that. Oh, now 
now may the God of peace, who is the author and the giver of peace, who brought again from among the dead the Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the everlasting, never failing covenant, make you perfect, give you everything you need. I like that. Strengthen you, complete you, perfect you, and make you what you ought to be, and equip you with what? Everything good that you may carry out his will. Wow. Everything you need, he's got. If you're willing to what? Obey him, love him, surrender. And I'm telling you, we need the anointing. We need an impartation. I'm telling you, God wants us to raise the dead. Mm -hmm. He said, these works that I do and greater works than these shall you do. See, I wouldn't believe that if it didn't come from the lips of Jesus. See, see God raised my mother twice from the dead. That ain't bad for a Southern Baptist, is it? <laughs> raised my mother twice from the dead. Look out now. See, God still raises the dead. One of my friends, the Lord said, I want you to raise the dead. And he's a good, good guy, and he's pretty intelligent. <clears throat> he said, oh, okay, you want me to raise the dead. Um, what do I need to do? And Jesus is not complicated. The question was, what do I need to do? He said, get around some dead people. If you're going to raise them, how are you going to do that? My friend volunteered at the hospital to be a chaplain. So that gave him rights to go into any room pray. And so that's how he gets to raise the dead. See? The same things that Jesus said he did, you can do. These works that I do and greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Well, you know, I don't even want to. Yes, you're supposed to be engaged in supernatural displays of the grace and the power of God. I'm telling you, as he is, so are we in this present world. I like to get to our player. He looks like he's whooping that thing, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. I like that. I like the guy over here. I gave him a word that one of the years I was up here. He, Psalms 144, verse. My, he, he, he teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. That's you know, so that's true. It's, it's a weapon, isn't it? Yeah. One time the Lord told me, said, I like that Jimi Hendrix sound. I thought, I said to him, sounds like two cats fighting in a sack to me. That's what it, but, uh, you know. So I want to talk to you about engaging with the Lord. He wants to carry you and catch you up. He does. I'm telling you, the veil between this world and the spirit world is thinner than it's ever been. Let me roll out a good verse for you. Ready? Here's your one. Yeah, I'm pulling the pen, and I'm tossing out Psalms 8411. He will be a sun and a shield to us. No good thing will he withhold from those that are walking upright. He will give us present day favor, future glory, honor, splendor, and heavenly bliss. As we stay in touch with him, we're always uh, we're ascending up. We're going up. Don't stagnate. I've never met any human being in their right mind that said, I've got all of God I want. The more you get, the more you realize. Listen, I'm telling you. We, there, there's a wealth that we have not tacked into right yet. But I'll tell you what, God wants to reveal himself, don't you think? And he's up to something. I, I'll just tell you straight out, you'll never be as acquainted with God as you need to be if you're shallow in this book. See, this book is not print on parchment. It's a person. And the word became what? And dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. I'm telling you guys. We've got to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Well, Bobby, I'm busy. Get up earlier. Yeah. Yeah. You say, well, Bobby, how do you study the Bible? Well, uh, I do Matthew 6, verse 6. Matthew 6, verse 6 says, if you're going to seek him, get in the quietest room of your house and shut the door. I did six months teaching on seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon the Lord while he's near. And the Lord appeared and shook his finger at me. Hey, here's what he said. You ready? Hey, that's what he said. Hey, when it comes to seeking me, I did test multitasking. Whoa. See, if you're going to seek him, you have to focus on him. Put your gaze upon him. Give him first place. I did test multitasking. That's what he said. All right. And so how do you seek the Lord? Matthew 6, 6, get in the quietest room of your house. And then it says this, Psalms 46, 10, 11, be still and know that I am God. We're a culture that don't like to get still. We're going to do something. We're going to put in something. We're going to turn on something. 
get still. Psalms 46, 10, 11. The Bible says, acquaint now thyself with God. Be at peace and good will come to you. How do you get acquainted with God? Spend time with him. Get in the word. Get, let the word get in you. Get in a quiet place. Now, I also seek, uh, I also have a room that I have a chair for Jesus to sit in. And it's not that he's wiggly, but he wants to fellowship with you. I'll tell you, now here's one. This is, this is mo the most, one of the most intimate moments I've ever had with Jesus. I'd been preaching 31 days. I'd average speaking five times and no less than three times a day for 31 days. I drag back home. I, I take a shower. I roll into the bed, and I just drifted off to sleep. And here's Jesus appeared to me right beside the bed, and he said, Bobby, that means come here. Bobby. And it, oh, man, here's what I said. I said, no, Lord, please. That's what I said. I said, listen, even the hair on my arms were tired. 31 days, five times a day mainly. And uh, uh, I said, no, Lord, please. He said, no, come. I had to throw my leg out of bed, and I reached down to get my notepad and a Bible, and he said, no, you'll not need those. And, uh, oh, man, uh, we will go down to the room where he and I meet, and uh, there's his chair, and uh, this is all true. He sat down in the chair and pulled me into his arms, and he rocked me just like this, just like you would rock a baby. And in, those, in that rocking moment, all the weariness, all of the exhaustion drifted away. I was as strong as an ox. He said, I didn't come to teach you. I came to be with you. He is our strength, isn't he? He's everything we need. And we need to spend time with him. Acquaint now thyself with God. Be at peace and good will come to you. The devil knows that verse. So what's he going to do? He's going to do everything he can to keep you from knowing God. Daniel 11.32b, have you read that in the day? Daniel 11.32b, it says, But the people that do know their God, they're going to display strength and take action. See, the devil doesn't want you to get to know God or what's accessible from God to you. He wants us to be ignorant. Oh, the Lord told me, said, Bobby. I said, yes. I want you to write a book about heaven. I better you know, turn around this way. I used to preach with my eyes closed. So my wife go, why do you do that? I said, well, it looks better there than here. You know, that's, that's true. That's, yeah, that's true. That's right. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> I, I see stuff just a whirling around, and it's good. Listen. Well, I, I want you to know something. God is up to something if, we, we, if we'll listen. He's got things to tell us and teach us. If we'll just say, Lord, speak, your servant's listening. And get, in a, uh, get into a, a mode of, of receiving from him and jot it down. Uh, the number one question I get asked around the world is, how would you memorize the Bible? I memorized it by studying the Bible till all of my fingers were holes in the pages. I've got a stack of Bibles that way. See, God didn't give us the spirit of fear, but love, power, and a what? The word sound mind means a mind that can catalog and retain facts. I'll tell you, some of you millennials, something you don't like it, but you'll never be able to memorize the Bible on a tablet or a computer. You can read it, and 10 minutes later, you can't tell me where it was or what it said. It's a great way to find the verses, but get you a Bible and mark, mark it up. And so God wants us to know some things about him and follow him fully. He's told me, he said, uh, he said you've got to tell my people, you cannot, you cannot medicate anxiety. You have to repent of it. See, be anxious for nothing. But prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. God wants to answer our prayers. Now, one time I, I wrote a book in there, and it's it, about heaven's host. That's what I was going to tell you about. I wrote a book about heaven's host, the faithful and the fallen. And so I, I, I put a lot in there about the faithful, some of their names, and I put a whole sl a plethora of things that the angels do for us and they did for Jesus. But anyway, uh, I, I was the book was uh, printed and I'm driving down the road in my truck, and the Lord appeared in the seat over there and said, Bobby, yes, I told you to write a book, Heaven's Host, the Faithful and the Fallen. I said, I did. He said, you did really well on the faithful, but you skipped over the fallen. And I was going to justify myself. Mm -hmm. 
And so I said to him, well, you know, I didn't want to give the devil much due. Ooh, didn't work. He wheeled around and said, you know my word. I will not have you ignorant, brother, concerning the devil and his devices. That's a verse in the Bible. And he said the only way to keep the body of Christ from being ignorant is to train them. So I had to rewrite the angel book and the, the, the uh, heaven's host, the faithful and the fallen. And we tell you about demons. We tell you how they smell. We tell you how they operate. And so you, you've... So it's pretty important to know your enemy, don't you think? And that's what we got to do. We got to really understand our enemy. Understand number one, he's defeated. Yeah, and uh, he's more afraid of you than you are him. I, don't you like that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. God has got me in some situations before. Here, here's one of them. You ready? The Lord said, "Bobby, I want you to go do a crusade in the Philippines." I thought soccer stadium. He meant Indiana Jones crusade. I flew over there to Manila. They put me on a helicopter. <laughs> Off we went. <laughs> Off we went to some island outside of the Philippines. <laughs> That's the helicopter landing. I want you all to have sound effects. And the helicopter landed out in a jungle uh, on a spot smaller than this. And uh, I get out. There's nobody there to greet me. The helicopter goes, and it's gone. It's gone. I'm standing out in the middle of a jungle, and they're in a full-blown revolution. Yeah! God didn't tell me about that. I said to him, you tricked me. He said you wouldn't have come any other way. I am there in a full-blown revolution. And the Lord said, I want you to preach. I said, to who? And there was two guys come out of there, and they had wires and a little battery that looked like a lawnmower battery, and they put the wires together, and a little light came on. And the Lord said, I want you to preach. I go, okay. So I preached just a simple message about Christ, and uh, I close my eyes, and I hear (laughs) all kind of racket, and I open my eyes, and I'm knee-deep in AK-47s. The, the warriors had come out of the jungle and threw their guns down at my feet. I thought, oh, boy. It was full-blown war. God, I, God said, don't get involved in their stuff. Just tell them the truth about the truth. Man, so anyway, here I am. We're, we're walking through the jungle, and they've got big old sticks beating the bushes. I go to this one guy that spoke sort of English. And uh, I said, What's, why are they beating the weeds? They said, there's a snake in there. If he bites you, you take two steps and you're dead. I said, beat on, brothers, beat on, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then watch this. Here we go up a volcano uh, pathway. Some dude jumps out, sticks an AK-47 in my back, and goes, Hashunukawa, wooa. Now, I might have mispronounced that. <laughs> but... He said, I said to the guy that could speak, I said, what did he say? He said, follow him. I thought, I'm with him. You know, he had a gun running in the back. So up the trail we go. And anyway, we get to a, a big wall, about as big as this right here, with trees and vines and all of that kind of stuff. And they go over there and manipulate something, and the whole thing opens up. It's a big cave. And I go in this cave, oh, Lord, they are, I, I imagine a thousand people in this cave sitting cross-legged, and they're, they're sitting there, and they're, they, they're don't, they don't speak Texican. They're, and I said, what do they want? And here's what he said. They want you to speak in here what you speak out there that causes people's face to light up. I said, oh, I can do that. In that cave, they had ground-to-air missiles like you shoot down planes. And listen, it was the wildest thing. See, but see, people say, Christianity's boring. Not with me. (laughs) It's not boring with me. Listen, it it was, God raised the dead over there. Uh, We get, we're walking up one of them volcano trails, and uh, some guy jumps out in there, and he's beating his chest and pointing up. So I, I said to the guy, what do you want? He said, he wants us to go with him. And we go there, and his wife comes out of a hut, 
and she's got a, a dead baby. It, he's, it's already blue and gray like and, uh, and dead. And so uh, uh, they're, they're wanting to know, can this God do anything? I said, yes, God can do something. So we prayed for the baby, and it looked like nothing happened. Baby's still purple, stiff and cold. And so we leave now. We go on up there and do a, a meeting, coming back down the next day, same pathway. The guy jumps out there, and he's jumping up and down. And he's beating himself in the chest and pointing him there. He, he carries me to the hut, and out she comes with the most beautiful baby uh, attached to her. Isn't that amazing? God raised the kid from the dead. Yes! And, but it was a great door open to get to, get to preach. And so, listen, uh, anyway, it, it, it was rough. We get over there, and uh, there's a, I, I could see a fire maybe four or 500 yards uh, up a mountainside there. And I said to the guys that are supposed to be directing me, I want to go up there. No, 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 no. And they had me in a hut where a guy had a piece of finger and an ear in a sack with some oil around it. And then, you know, so that's where I'm staying. I'm staying in a hut with a, a maniac, had an ear and a finger in a sack around his neck. And yeah! Don't fuss about a Holiday Inn. <laughs> anyway. This guy's down there, he's wild, he's crazy on, and he's jumping up down like a gorilla. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I thought, man, I get up there, and I'm going to be there 14 days and 14 nights, and the only light in the thing was a, a rag running up a coffee cup with some, a coffee can, and it's burning. And so I said, I better leave the fire on because that guy's down there, uh, and I, I'll have to stay awake. And the Lord laughed at me. The Lord said, you're going to stay awake 14 days and 14 nights? I go, no, I don't guess I will. <laughs> and I blew out the light, and it got so dark in there. Uh, demons were whirling around. It sounded like an attic fan. And I lay down and slept like a baby. See, God's either who he says he is or this thing's a big joke. And so anyway, I wanted to go over there. I'm going over there. <laughs> I'm going over there. They said, no, I went. Oh, boy, come with me through the jungle. <laughs> and I get closer there, and I see something sitting on a, a log by a burning fire, does not have one stitch of clothes on, stark naked, scars on him as big as your thumb all over his body. And what he was, he was like that big guy in the Bible, the demoniac. He would go into the village and they'd hack him out with machetes. That's why they didn't want to go over there. So there I am, and I thought, oh, boy, I should have brought somebody with me. And then I realized I had somebody with me. The Lord said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So here's the naked guy, and I said, I'm here to tell you about Jesus. I don't speak. Here's what happened. When I said I'm here to tell you about Jesus, he squeals like an animal and jumps up and runs up into a hut in the tree. And I thought, well, he may come out with a machete or something like that, but he came out with a ragtag T-shirt. He had heard the word Jesus, and he said, it, it, that it, he wanted to honor, you know, not be naked in front of Jesus and put on a ragtag T-shirt. We lead this guy to Jesus, and I'm talking Texican, and we carry him back to the village there. They're scared of him. They hacked him out, and he stands there and preaches to him. And these people crawling on the ground, crying out to God, see, I'd have never, I wouldn't have went over there, but we had a pretty good time, you know. You say, what happened to the maniac with the... Well, the last time I saw him, he broke through the, the bamboo curtain and he was running through a rice paddy, you know. Oh, man, kind of a, a comical-looking thing. But you, we've got to learn how to have a good time, don't you think? Yeah. We, got to, we, we, we really have. I fly all the time in, in the planes. And, boy, here's one. Uh, I was really tired, so I'm sitting in an exit row seat by the aisle, and there's a businesswoman there and a businesswoman over there, and uh, here was my plan. I was going to lay my head back against the back of the seat, and when the plane took off, the vibration would wake me up. That was my plan. All right, I laid back like this, exhausted from all the travel. I'm, I go to sleep. I'm not, I'm not awakened by the jet taking off. 
I'm awakened by somebody going, <laughs> me. I am snoring like a hog. And guess where I'm at? I'm laying in this woman's lap like a lap baby. I'm not on her shoulder. I'm curled up in her lap. At, you know, at first I didn't panic. I thought, well, Carolyn. I thought my wife was with me. Then I realized she ain't on the trip. Oh, man. I said, ma'am, I'm so sorry. Why didn't you just push me out in the aisle? She says, I couldn't wake up somebody sleeping that good. Boy, I wasn't sleepy another moment in that flight. In the flight. Woo. Isn't that something? I mean, I'm up in her lap, curled up. Okay. We've seen, we've, we've had people raised from the dead on the plane. Isn't that something? Yeah, I was sitting there, and one guy goes by and goes, ah, fell over. I thought, I thought, wow, he's having some trouble. Here comes, here comes some guys with his pads and all of this, and the, he's, he's about the color of the carpet. And they, 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 finally they go, well, he's gone. And so I, the Lord said, get up and go raise him up. And I said, Okay. So there he's stretched out there, and they've already got him. They pumped him and all this kind of stuff, shocked him and all that. So uh, I walk over there, and the two medics are still there. And they go, are, are you in the medical field? I said, sort of. <laughs> yeah. And they go, well, it's too late. He's gone. I said, no, it's, and I put my hand on his throat, and he coughed real big. And the two medics, they took off. I hadn't seen them in the whole rest of the flight. You know, <laughs> off they went. But... See, we got to start enjoying stuff. Uh, here's what I do. I buy the cheapest ticket and beg God to bump me up. And most time he'll do it, you know. This time I was in 37 mouth. I'm up against the urinal in the very back. You can't get me further back. And I'm mad. God, how come I'm back here? He didn't say nothing. Anyway, there I am, I, but I do have three seats by myself. Nobody else is going to book 37 mouth, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I got three seats by myself, and here comes a flight attendant. We, we got up in there, and here comes a flight attendant. She's scurrying by me like this. And when she gets even with me, here's what I said. You ready? Hey, I want some of them chocolate chip cookies. That's what I said. And she slid to a halt. She wheeled around and goes, ah, you're psychic. I said, no, I'm not. I'm prophetic. God shows me the secrets of people's heart. And she screamed and ran off. I said, God, that's weird. Here she comes. She taps me on the shoulder. She's got four cookies and two glasses of milk. And she said, uh, scoot over. I scooted over. She let down the thing and sat down. And she said, who tells you what's going on? I said, God tells me about what's happening. She said, uh, would you look at me and see what's going on with me? I said, yes, I will. And, uh, boy, I looked at her, and she was as easy to read as anything in the world. She had a daughter named Julie, a teenage daughter, that had turned into some, turning into some dark things. That, uh, and I, I told her about it. I said, but God's going to reclaim her. Oh, she cried. Makeup went running down, dripping off. And then finally she got her composure took off, and in a moment she comes back and said, get your stuff, and it was off to the big seats. <laughs> yeah! See there? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I try to get on before the pilot does many times, you know. But anyway, we've had some good times. Then I've had some pretty rough ones. Can I walk around? I will. Can I walk around? I don't, this thing, you know, here we go. But sometimes it messes up the camera, but, you know, there's plenty of me to see, you know. <laughs> All right. Now, I like adventure. Don't you? I'm off down in the tip of Texas, down there in Del Rio, you know, and they got uh, orchards planted. There's, you know, and so I was down there with a the preacher, and we're driving down a, a dirt road out in the countryside. Vroom! It's a plane comes right over us, boom, and landed out in the field, one of these crop dusters. And here's what I said to the pastor. 
man, I'd like to ride in one of them. He said, you would? Yeah. He turns the car around, off we go. We drive in there to this place where the car, the plane's getting filled up with whatever chemical and some fuel. And the pastor says, there's a visiting man here. He said, uh, he would like to ride in the plane. And the owner of the flight thing said, okay. So he hollered at the pilot and said, he wants to go up. Put him in. I go, okay. Now, have you ever seen one of those planes that got two wings and got a seat looks like it came from Walmart? <laughs> it, it's, it's, and so I get in there, and they buckle me in, with, and I'm sitting on this seat, and there's one little rod between my legs there. We take off. <laughs> and it's <laughs> off we went. And boy, it looks so pretty up there. You can see the orchard, and everything's laid out really good. And I'm looking like this, and it's, it's very scenic. We're way up there. And here's what I said. See, I believe you're supposed to be evangelistic. So I said to the pilot, Do you know Jesus? See, it's loud in there. Huh? Do you know Jesus? What? Are you a Christian? Oh, Lord. Full-blown demon. Manifest like you couldn't, you couldn't imagine. Every blasphemous word you could think of came out of his mouth. And he jerks the plane like this. Now, I'm not some kind of aeronautical genius. Here we go. We're going down. That thing's doing like this. And you know, they said, oh, your life will flash forward. Crazy. My life didn't flash forward nothing. Here's what I thought. There won't be enough of me left to bury when we hit the ground. That's what I thought. Yeah. Just, and boy, you can see the ground coming up and that thing's spinning around. I thought, okay. And so anyway, right before we hit, he pulled it out. And, blah, blah, blah. and so, basically, here's what I thought when I, I thought, let him go to hell, you know. <laughs> that's what I thought. Then I thought, that's not evangelistic, is it? <laughs> so I said, what's your problem with God? I'll tell you what his problem with God was. The local Baptist, he went off to fight in the war, and the local Baptist preacher ran off with his wife. That, that was his problem, you know. And so, isn't that something? So, but anyway, it's adventurous. And I like adventure. Can I give you one more story about adventure? Well, sure, buddy. <laughs> down, uh, down there in Texas, they've got what they call a belt buster. You know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, at the ice cream place they make a hamburger called the belt buster so I'm going to preach and I've got pretty nice clothes on and I see the sign belt buster so I turn the blinker and pulled in and I'm just about to get out of the car to go in and order and here comes a motorcycle boom a, Indy, a big old chopper motorcycle boom right beside the truck and this guy's got uh, matted black hair he's got go to hell and how to get there tattooed on him so I had a track. I pulled out a track. It says, I asked because I care. I said, here, I'd like to give you this. It tells about Jesus. He looked at it and said a few words about your mother and some other people. <laughs> yeah. I said, that's a nice bike. He said, you like bikes? And I do. And he uh, said, yeah. So he, guess what he says? Get on. He said, you want to take a ride? I go, yeah. What? It's idiotical. Get on with somebody you've never seen your whole life. And he's already, so anyway, I said, yeah. So I get on. This is me throwing my leg over that chopper motorcycle. Boom, boom. The whole thing, everything I had was shaking. We pull out on Prairieville Street in Athens, Texas. You can Google it. We pull out on Prairieville Street, and he lets her rip. Boom. We get down there to the, next, the first red light, and he does a donut with me on the back of this motorcycle. I've got my hands laid on him. I got him in a chokehold. His hair's blowing in my mouth. He does a spin around and gets back, carried me back to the Dairy Queen. Whew, I did. I wasn't hungry for nothing. I just wanted. To, and uh, he said, "You wanted to talk to me?" I said, "Yes, I do. I did." But no. Uh, and. Here's where we lead him to Christ, standing by his motorcycle. He said, uh, we broke into the 
barn out there by the airport and said, I got my whole gang out there. Would you come with me and tell them what you told me? And so I get to go out there to a, a rene renegade motorcycle gang and get to stand there. They had stole some ute boxes and broke into a barn and all that kind of stuff. And had, they looked like rats in the hay. And he kicked the plug out of the wall and music stopped. The people, they were they're cussing. Hey! And he said, I want you to listen to what this man has to say. He has something to tell us. And I'm telling you, these old big old boys, they'd come and tears would run down, cry like babies, giving their heart to Christ. And then right at the end of it, I thought, boy, this is really good. Right at the end, a little skinny motorcycle mama about that tall, she walks right up to, clears her throat, and spit in my face. I thought, I'll slap her to Monday. You know what I mean? <laughs> but then I thought, that's not the way. The Lord said, you know, you win some, you, you know. But spit right now. You know. <laughs> yeah. But this guy ends up running a youth department in a church, this, the, the leader of the motorcycle gang. But what we got to do is be flexible. Well, you know, yeah. You say, well, Bobby, you got any more stories like that? I got, listen, I have. I got some. I've been shot at, knifed, hit in the head with stuff. But it's all in a day's work, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But now this sounds like a yarn, but don't lie in church. We had a doctor that came. Um, I called him. I called him by his uh, pet name that is only his mother had ever called him. So it won him over, and so he's coming. He started coming to our church because I called him. And anyway, he was a trauma doctor at the hospital, and when they had real trauma stuff, they'd call me. So I'm there just at Mazio Pizza playing, about to get me a slice of pizza, and the phone rang. They said, uh, you need to go out to the hospital. The doctor wants you there. Oh, my. I go out there, and Dr. Thomas, the guy that we, we know, uh, he, he, there's a kid laying there uh, with his head off of the gurney, and he's dead. And the doctor said, Bobby, we did everything we could to revive him. They had ground hoses down. He, he was in a drug deal and with a, a lady old enough to be his mother, and she left him, and he just tried to, he could, tried to kill him. Well, he did kill himself. So there he is, and man, I, I thought, man, God, we just can't let this kid step out into eternity like this. And I, I, I just, I, all I did, I said, Lord, I pray your perfect will be done with him. And he, he raised his up and coughs and got resurrected from the dead. And I'm telling you, it, it's amazing, amazing. Joined our church, and yeah. But uh, God wants to show himself strong. We've got to be willing to get in the arena where people are at. We got to get out of the four walls into the marketplace. I think what made Jesus so successful, it says he went about doing good. If the devil can cage us up in four walls, he will, won't he? Look at COVID. Listen, we got to get out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. We got to let our light shine. And listen, it's okay. Uh, it, it really is. Talk to people that you think are hopeless. That look like, you'll never listen, witness to them. And I'm telling you, God will make a change. It's pretty wild. I'd, I'd been over in Paris, France, preaching. I'd been to Paris, Paris, preaching. And they put me on a plane in Charles de Gaulle Airport, one of these big double-decker planes. Here we come. <laughs> and uh, we get, we're going out, and somehow the pilot makes a big, hard turn and then he comes on the thing goes well I guess you see that uh, we've had a little problem we're going back in we've lost an engine so back to Charles de Gaulle airport we came okay they put us in a place with the seats going up like that in the room because they didn't want 400 of us scattered through the, the uh, Charles de Gaulle airport and it had seats that went up like this and nearly 90% of the people on the plane were plastic surgeons you know, how to nip and tuck and pull and staple and stuff like that. And they've been to Paris to learn some new techniques. And they're back there now, and they're mad as they can be because the plane's messed up. So I'm sitting on the front row of this thing. They're back there using language. And so I said, God, what happened? He said, well, I turned the plane around because I want you to preach. I said, God, I don't feel like preaching. He said, you felt like preaching in the conference. He said, I want you to preach here. I thought, oh, Lord. 
so there they are all mad, about half drunk now, or a little over, puking drunk, you know. And so he said, uh, you felt like preaching at the conference, you're, you're going to preach here. I said, okay. And so I, I thought I was being kind of quiet, and I stood up and I said something like, I was going to say ladies and gentlemen, but it came out like a roar. I had their undivided attention. <laughs> Preach the gospel, and these people started getting saved. And you, they, you'd have never got them in a church, but so the church got them in this deal. And they, they'd come up and just pour their heart out. And it was easy. It wasn't, it wasn't striving. You just tell the story. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So all we got to do is tell people about him and display him. That was pretty wild. Oh, man. I got on there. They were there. I go, oh. I go no, man. I tell you, I was raised rough. I did. I told you all about cutting my tongue off. Told you about getting ripped on and spilled all my guts. Did you ever hear that story? I fell on a saw that my uncle was sharpening, and it ripped me all. All my guts fell out. I was beside myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't lie in church. It, it started here and ripped me all the way, and all my guts fell out. My grandpa, he was not a medic. He plowed a mule called Shorty. And he ran down there and jerked up the guts. And he didn't say, this looks like a spleen or it could be a kidney. He just pulled the flap home and stuck it in. Leaves, chicken poop, chicken feathers in me. They tied me together with a bed sheet. Mm -hmm. Tied me together with a bed sheet. You say, well, where's your mama? Well, she got on a Greyhound bus to go out to Austin State School for the Blind to get my cousin because her mother cocked a, three, uh, a, a 38 caliber Smith and Weston shot her the daughter through the head, didn't kill her, but it blinded her. So that's where my mother was. She was getting Linda from the state school for the blind. They tied me in, up in bed sheets and they laid me in there in my grandpa's room. And this, I went unconscious here. See, I told you he picked my guts up and put them back in there, carried me in there in my grandmother's kitchen, laid me down, and that's when they, they cured meat with salt. He jerked up a big scoop of salt, pulled the lap, boom. Say invigorating. <laughs> and then, here's what happened. They cook with kerosene, and he goes over there and pulls up a jug of kerosene, pulls the flap, pours it in, and the ceiling turned purple, and I went unconscious, you know. And so they tied me up and put me in my grandfather's bed, and I'm, I'm awakened by this sound two days later. <laughs> that ain't a good word. That's the doctor there saying to my mother, we're not going to suture him up because we don't think he's going to make it. We're just going to let him drain. I go, hey, I'm going to make it, you know. So they never sutured me up or anything. I just grew together myself. I told the story in California. A guy back there looked like he's trying to stop a bus in New York. I said, hey, you want to say something? He goes, yes. He said, I'm a leading gastrologist surgeon. Yeah, yeah. I go, well, good boy. I'm a leading gastrologist surgeon. He said, could I come examine you? I go, come on, knock yourself out. Here he comes. He comes. I, did, I was up on the platform. I didn't want to take my shirt up and look, look like Free Willy. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I got behind the curtain, and he, he examines me, this leading gastrologist. He's pushing and pulling. He's going, oh, oh, ah, oh, you've got to come to my office. Why? I've got to document this. I said, I don't need no documentation. I was there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. He said, no, you have to suture this or it herniates. But, you know, I'm still a kicking. I'm 80 years old, speaking the largest youth conferences in the world. I said, well, they want to see a fat guy sweat. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, they want to know two things. Is that Bible real and can I do it? The answer is yes, yes. And I'll tell you what, we're going to see a, a generation that's bold and brave, very courageous. They're going to, they're going to be fearless for all the right reasons. Uh, so anyway, we've, we've had a good, good time. Uh, I'm kind of famous for mischief. I, I turned a, chi a truckload of chickens loose that we'd stolen it and we turned them loose in the school. That was a price to pay. You can't imagine the mess a truckload of chickens can make in a school. <laughs> Poop everywhere. If you, if you were to steal a truckload of chickens and put them in your school, 
vacuum your truck. So they, they found out who was the culprit. Me and the football boys, really. Oh, Lord. They made us get in there and put on hazmat stuff and scrub the floors for two hours every evening after school and then have football practice. Yeah, but anyway, it was kind of fun. I blew up the, I, well, I don't want to talk about my delinquency. Oh, boy. I'd see, here's what I try to tell you. If I can make it, you got a shot. Yeah. I was in and out of all kind of trouble. But anyway, God said if we'll follow him, he'll make us very, very beneficial to humanity. And so that's what we've got to do. We've got to tell the story about Jesus in a way that people really realize he's who he says he is. And he's, he's absolutely awesome. So we're going to get an anointing. You're going to get what anointing? Strengthened, complete, perfected, make you what you ought to be to give you everything you need to accomplish the task you're sent to do. We need it, don't we? Now, he's, he's available, and you're going to get it. Uh, I'll tell you, a boldness is going to come on you. Not, not a pushy, but a genuine concern and a boldness. And we've got to tell people about Jesus. And man, I love it. It's, it I, we had a gang when I was growing up, the Red Rats. Oh, Lord. Most of them, you know, the ones that didn't get saved are dead. But uh, one, of, one of the guys, was a, he, was, he could have been a movie star. I mean, absolutely handsome. Knock, knockout handsome. Jimmy was his first name, and he had married into Texas oil money. Had all the money you could imagine. He married an oil man's daughter. And so I'm going through Athens, Texas, and uh, I hear a, a horn honking. And I look over the window sill, and there's a, a Corvette, and it's Jimmy. He's honking the horn. I hadn't seen him in years. And he's honking the horn. So we pull over. And uh, he said, hey, get in. So I slid in the car, and he opens the console and runs a line of cocaine. I said, nope, I don't do that. I've, I've given my heart and my life to Jesus. And here's what he said. You ready? Oh, man. He looked at me and said, if that's what you want, you go your way, I'll go mine. Oh, man. Oh, Lord. That's the last words I heard him say. If that's what you want, you go your way, I'll go mine. Handsome debonair looking guy, all the money you could imagine from the oil field. And he goes back to their, their home down there uh, in Texas, and his wife was cheating on him. So he walks in a club, pumps a shotgun, shoots his wife's head off, puts it in his mouth and blows the back of his head off. You go your way, I'll go mine. See, there's a way that seems right, but the way of that way is death and doom. Jesus wants us to come to him. So I, I'm telling you guys, I don't want that to ever happen to anybody else, I know. I don't want them to spend eternity in hell when heaven's this close. And I'm telling you, you go your way, I'll go mine. No, we're going to have to be more, uh, we're going to have to be bolder than that. But anyway, I'll, I, 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 don't ever, I don't want to ever forget that urgency of the hour. See, there's, there's people you know that's just that lost. And we've got to tell them about Jesus. I'm telling you, just open up and sh let your light shine. But anyway, I've, I've enjoyed this church. Remember the word I gave you during the round table or whatever we was having? Uh, expand. Expand. And uh, that's going to be good. And uh, God wants us to expand, don't you think? Yeah. Okay. You say, well, Bobby, how's that going to work? Well, it is work to grow a church, isn't it? But we've got to find people that have the same heart. Yeah, and the same DNA, and that, that's how it works the best. Bill Johnson, I told him about Bethel years ago. I said, the only way Bethel will work, it has to become a franchise. See, where you get the same thing no matter which Bethel you walk into, and that's the way it's going to be with this church. It'll pick up the same heart, and, and the leaders will have the same kind of a pulse that you've got. But uh, what a day to be alive. People are desperate enough to listen now. You know that, don't you? They're desperate enough to listen. Uh, for 29 years, say 29 years, on the Day of Atonement, I've had a visitation from Jesus Christ. He'll come tell me some of the things that's going to happen in the future, and I'm writing a book called The Shepherd's Rod. Now, when I left coming up here, The Shepherd's Rod 2024 just arrived down at the Texas office. I was coming out of Charlotte. I've got the one for uh, 23. Oh, my. You talk about something. It was a 
you, you can get it out there at the book table. I'll sign your book. God told me, said, I want you to start signing books. I said, I don't sign books. He said, you do now. So I told my wife, I said, we're going to have a book signing. She said, I didn't know we had signed books. I said, we do now. First, first book I ever signed. It was pretty wild. I knew my name, so I wrote it. And then, you know, we've seen miracles happen there. Well, I mean, real miracles happen at the book table. One guy came up, and he had a big old bandage around his hand. And uh, so I, I said to him, what happened? He said, well, I'm a carpenter, but apparently not a very good one. I cut my finger off with a saw. And guess what I said? I pointed at him and said, God's got original parts. And this guy looked at me funny. Then he started shaking his hand, and I, he had a heart. And his wife was standing there, and she thought, oh, man, the bandage is too tight. And he starts ripping this bandage off. And God had grew him a brand-new finger, a brand-new finger at the book table. Watch this. His wife was standing there, and she goes, huh, I'm not one of these wild-eyed charismatics. I don't even believe in half this stuff, but I am the hospital nurse. And I was there when the doctor pulled the skin over and tacked it right here, and God had given her husband a brand-new finger. See? It, it's, it's pretty amazing. I like that. And we get, sometimes we'll give people words and one time, a little uh, lady, she brought her granddaughter up, and the, the granddaughter was about half mad for being in church that long, and the little lady said, uh, mm, I sure want to get one of these books. I said, well, you just get what book you want. And I looked over her shoulder to her granddaughter, and I said, if you don't mind, I want to tell you something's going to happen to your granddaughter. And the granddaughter's looking like me. And uh, I said, she's going to be on a magazine for makeup, you know, what do you call it? Uh, and the other little girl goes, and sure enough, two meetings later, uh, two months later in a meeting, here comes the grandmother and the girl. She's got her face on one of these cosmopolitan things and they've been hired for makeup, you know. And so th then she believed anything I'd say to her, you know. Yeah. That's what you got to do. You got to tell people the truth about the truth and, and win them over. Yeah. And so you say, well, one thing we've got to teach the young prophets is this. They are the postman, not the author. You, you have to give what God gives. You know, you don't have the right to just come up with your own stuff. You're the postman, not the author. And that helps, doesn't it? Well, anyway, so let's, let's, let's see what's up. You want to? So anyway, here's one thing that's going to happen. Anybody that has a sleep disorder, if you'll stand to your feet, I'll pray a two-minute prayer over you, and your sleep disorder will be gone. Okay, anybody else here, son? I'm talking about uh, night sweats. I'm talking about night terrors. I'm talking about uh, just sleeplessness. Okay, here we go. Lord, your word declares you lay us down and our sleep will be sweet. I come against every kind of, uh, of spirit that's trying to manipulate people's uh, sleep, wear them out, and get them restless. And, Lord, we thank you that your word is true. You'll lay your servants down and their sleep will be sweet. And so, Lord, lay them down, help them to sleep well, and wake up refreshed rejuvenated, and ready to face the day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, that's it. Watch this. We got a file of people. One guy said, I didn't sleep without medication for 40 years till you made that simple prayer. Now, isn't that something? You don't have to medicate everything, okay? Jesus is the healer. Anyway, so, so you'll sleep well. That's a good thing. And so you say, well, uh, Bob, is there anything else God wants to do? Yeah, he wants to deal with uh, livers that are going bad. Uh, so if you've got somebody, a loved one or somebody, and they've got livers, liver that's going bad, uh, God's going to cause the, the myra in their bones to begin to grow fat, and that'll be good. It'll heal the liver. So there are some folks that's got some liver problems, and God's going to heal the liver. And if the doctors look at you, they'll say, your bones are waxing fat, and that's a good thing, not, not bad when it comes to liver, but he's going to, he'll heal you. Just put your hand and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for healing. I receive your healing in Jesus' name. Amen. We've watched him raise the dead. He can do anything, can't he? he you cannot, you can't find a single thing he can't do. And he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above. I was watching him a while ago when the praise was going on. There was tr quite a bit of transaction going on here, you know, I'm telling you, stepping into a brand, new, uh, a brand new life. I'm telling you, we don't have to stay in bondage. Here's your great, great verse. I, I gave you Psalms 84, 11. Here's one, Psalm 65, 11. 
it says um, that it says he crowns this year with his goodness, and everywhere his chariot wheels roll, it drips with fatness or plenty. So, what kind of year we're going to have? A year that's crowned with his goodness. Psalm sixty-five, eleven. He crowns this year with his goodness, and everywhere his chariot wheels roll, it drips with fatness. Plenty. So I like that. And remember I told you, anything that's been done once, there's a better way to do it. So, And then some of you are right on the verge of embracing witty inventions. That's in the Bible. Witty inventions. Smart plans that work out. So uh, one, one thing somebody's going to come up with, it's going to be very lucrative. It'll be like Ford was to a car. Uh, and it's these virtual reality goggles. They're going to take the mechanics of the Avatar movie, and they're going to look in the Bible and get these biblical stories about angels and, and put it on virtual reality with the same kind of uh, mechanics of the Avatar movie. It'll be one of the greatest teaching tools the church has ever had. Okay? And, boy, we've raised a generation. They're, they're, they're ready to strap on something. Okay? And we might as well have them strap on the truth that will set them free. And so somebody's going to make that, put it together. I talked to some animators uh, just the other day, and uh, so listen, there's plenty of room, and it'll be very lucrative. Boy, you can get into some situations. Here comes an Indian guy, not one of these, oh, one of these, uh, Indian, yeah. Uh, listen, I, I've, I've tried to find uh, enough friends with some Indians. I want to know, listen, is Bombay that way? This way? I don't know which way what. But anyway, man, I tell you what, here's, here comes this little Indian guy. And he comes running up to me, and in, in I'm trying to get out of the meeting. And he comes running up to me, and he's very small, but he's got a baggie full of dirt. And he said, Oh, I say, Oh, Lord, say to me, I give you dirt, you analyze. Lord said, You give me dirt, and I'll analyze it. Yeah. I said, Give it here got me a bag of dirt, <laughs> and when I got a hold of this bag of dirt, equations started pouring out. Now, in a long story short, this guy that ran up with a bag of dirt, they ship, ship loads of that dirt off of uh, Cambodia coastline to make these uh, computer chips. This guy has an office in uh, Sydney, Australia in those little high-rise buildings. The, yeah, Okay. Isn't that something, and just making more money you can turn around with. But see, we're supposed to know things. We've, we've prophesied all, all reserves, the, the largest oil reserves in the history. We've, we've prophesied about them. And it, it, that's what he, we've got to come and start doing stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, one time I got, uh, in, I got handcuffed in my own meeting by the police. What happened, Bobby? Well, here's what happened. We were in a big old place in Brenham, Texas, in a big meeting, and I said, yes, yes, there's been a ritualistic murder over there. And I called out a bridge number, and I said, boy, that was weird. I'll tell you what was weird. When the service was over, here comes two policemen, and they, they put the bracelets on me and said, you, where'd you get that information? I said, God. No, they go, where'd you get that? See, I knew the bridge, and I knew there'd been a ritualistic murder there, and they were trying to solve it. I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm guiltless that way, but I could help you. And sometimes God will show you what's going on, and, and you can tell the police. You can tell the government if they want to listen. I, I don't want to tell the ones we got now. They haven't got, well, but uh, we, pro we prophesied the terrorist attack, and, and you can read about it. Inside information with the CI, DI, whatever they, you know. But anyway, God's going to take care of us. You know that, don't you? He's not asleep at the wheel. And he wants to use us. People are desperate enough now to listen. I mean, just look them straight in the eye and tell them the truth about the truth. And present Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And listen, God wants people saved. And so... That motorcycle gang, that was fun. Uh, I pastored a church, and here's what happened. You ready? I was at home one time, and the Lord said, oh, I want you to turn on TV. So I turned on the TV, and it was some rock show, and they were stage diving, jumping out, stage diving. 
And the Lord said, what do you think about that? I go, what do you think about it? And he said, I think it's a shame the world can have more fun than my children. I said, what do you want? He said, I want you to start stage diving in First Baptist Church. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I said, yep, stage diving. Now, I'll tell you, you don't need a deacon board meeting for that. <laughs> you know, you just slip up on them with, yeah. Anyway, here's our stage diving. We had two men caught men and women caught women. And I'll tell you, people would take off and run and jump and they'd be healed by the time they got back to the floor. Over and over and over again. I don't care what disease it was. It was the wildest thing. Now, I'm not, well, I guess I am promoting stage diving, but <laughs> it worked for us. Yeah. I mean, listen, a, a visiting preacher came in, and he had a chronic back thing, and uh, our guys would jerk him up like a football player and run with him like the coach that won. He goes, no, Bobby. My, I said, it's a way too late for whining. You know, <laughs> the guys grabbed him up and made around with him, totally healed him. Wow. He was in our meeting down in Charlotte this week. God wants to heal people. You say, well, Bobby, what if I pray for them and they don't get it? Well, they won't get healed if you don't pray for them. Pray for them. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person gets the job done. Well, anyway. Okay, well, I want to I pray for you, okay? Here, I, uh, I see lineage lines over and over and over and over. And here, here's your great verse about lineage line. It says, uh, Isaiah 44, 3 and 4. It says, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, floods upon dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants, and they will spring up like willows by a fertile river. And so uh, I, after a while, I'm going to go back there and sign books, and I'll give you a verse. Yeah, I'll give you a verse. There's a lot of verses in the Bible. Here's one. You ready? The bed's too short, and the cover's too narrow to get any rest like that. It, that's in the Bible. And it's the futility of trying to cover up your own life. It'd be like me trying to lay across this pulpit and cover up with a handkerchief. You ain't going to get any rest like that. It's the futility of trying to uh, get you to save yourself, you know. But there's the verses that you need. You say, what verse, you know, ask God to show you the word that he has, a now word, and he'll do it. Have you ever done that? He'll just, well. So anyways, get in the word and let the word get in you and enjoy the word. Memorize it. Quote it back to yourself. Okay? Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that doesn't have to be ashamed. Well, anyway, uh, this is a fertile field here. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there's somebody doing something uh, all the time. I mean, listen, it's pretty. But see, that's good, isn't it? And so uh, I don't mind getting with the weird, you know. Uh, I looked at one time. Now, I'm, this is crude. I looked at one time in the second row, and there was a big black man with a big fuzzy black beard and two boobs sitting there. God said, you see that? I go, yeah. He said, go out there and dialogue with him. I go, okay. So out there I go, and uh, he's a big old guy, but he's, you know, and he said, uh, I said, uh, I have an anointing on you to set you free, and you can be the man you need to be. And he says, you know, you know and he speaks, and he says, he says, I have a couple of issues. I said, yes, I can see them. You know, you know yeah. Uh -huh. but just keep on poking till something happens. You know what I mean? Don't be so easily turned off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. I, I got a lot of stuff to talk about. I got my... I'm going to go to the book table in a minute. Hey, here's one. I, they carried me to a fancy place where you have to sign in, and you, everybody should. Have you ever, they, they, they whisper in there, why'd you sign up? You know? But now, anyway, uh, and so the lady that was checking us in, a college kind of gal, and the Lord said, she doesn't know me. She's lost. But I'm going to show you something about her that you know, she knows you could never know, and it's going to win her to me. So I'm, I'm sitting down, and the pastor has two doctor's degrees that's with us, and, and I'm picking on the meat, and he said, is something wrong with your meat? I said, no, no, it's not that. It's the lady that checked us in. She doesn't know Jesus, but Jesus is going to show me something about her. She knows I could never know, and it's going to lead her to Christ. 
And he goes, yeah, that's what I want. That uh, power evangelism is what he called it. Okay, so we finish eating. We get up there. And there she is. She's, it, it, she's dressed okay, and she's behind a little desk. And I said, uh, ma'am, I hope you don't think I'm really weird, but uh, I see you don't know Jesus as your Savior but he's going to show me something about you that you know I could never know, and it's going to convince you that he knows all about you and you're going to give your heart to him. I said, uh, is that okay? She goes, whatever, like this. And so I'm waiting for God to show me this, what's going to happen. This is where it gets touchy. All of a sudden, I got a vision. It's her inner thigh. I think it's the devil. Shut up on the God said, nope, it's me. I said, I see the inner thigh, and I see a, a black widow spider's nest appear in her tummy uh, there. And I go, <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I see that you, uh, you have a black widow spider, and there's a, a web around your belly, and it's a quiet, very prestigious place. And she goes, yeah! Plumb up to her chin. Yeah! I said, good God, girl, put your shirt down. <laughs> but it was, it was dinner and a floor show. But she got born again. See? Born again. And that pastor paid, paid the price for me coming. Oh, Lord. I, I tell you, it was Sunday morning, and you've seen these guys that have that beautiful hair. The pastor, he, he, he had beautiful hair. I mean, every hair, and it's gray and pulled back and smooth. And I'm up there preaching Sunday morning. This guy's got two doctor's degrees and all that. But, and in comes a guy with purple, a purple uh, spiked hair sticking up here. And the building's plumb full of people. And the Lord, that kid came in with that big old spiked hair. And I said, I've never seen him. Hey, dude, where you been? He goes, Dude, I overslept. I said, well, come here a minute. They hadn't seen him ever. Here he comes. And there's Pastor Paul, the, the good-looking pastor. And here comes the kid. And I said, I got a plan. Well, what plan is that? I said, let's spike Pastor Paul's hair. <laughs> pastor Paul goes, hmm. I go, hmm. <laughs> and so we got a choir robe down, put it around Pastor, set him down there. Poured water, and I, I spike. And that, that kid, when, when I said, let's spike his hair, he goes, dude, that's what's in this sack. He had brought some uh, spike. Anyway, we spike, we spike Pastor Paul's hair. I had a time. I pulled it. It was about this high, just sharp as a. And the guy goes, oh, it's going to take weeks to go. You know, that's, uh, don't tell him, man. But guess what happened? Guess what happened? The next Sunday, the whole side was filled with these gothic kids because they heard that a pastor let us spike his hair. And I mean, it looked like the Adams family. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that something? See, you got to be creative. Yeah, yeah. But he's invited me back before, you know. Pretty brave, brave man, isn't he? Yeah. Okay, now, here's what I want you to know. God wants you to be pure and clean. The devil wants you to get confused, full of shame, full of fear. Fear hath torment. And what you need to do is just come clean with God. Just say, Lord, I, I want you to remove this out of my life. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I'm telling you what, when you, the devil wants you into sin because it will bring shame and timidity. And I think our timidity is testimony to our carnality because the righteous will be bold as a lion. So none of you are past the grip of God and just cast your care upon him and say, Lord, take this, and he will. He really will, and uh, he'll make you a new creation. He'll clean you up. You believe that? This is yes, unless you're where? Oh, there we go. No. You know, okay, I've had a lot of fun. I went off in some place and they were going to feed me monkey head. Oh, Lord. And the cameras were there and he's a big wig guy. And boy, everybody, people were applauding. 
and I couldn't see. It was dark in there. It had candles, and they brought it and put it in front of me. And I'm looking, to see what it is. I saw two fuzzy ears. <laughs> Monkey head! Yeah, they they decrane it, they boil it, and then stick the thing and put the lid back on, and then they and then and see they say don't turn it down, it's offensive. I go, I'm going to offend them one way or another. You know, you know, right before you puke, that hot water gets in your throat. I go, and then listen, I say, God, you got to help me. I ain't eating this monkey head. And here's what happened. A verse came to me. I changed my voice. I sound, I sounded like Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, and <laughs> anybody you could think. I changed my voice, and there's the rich guy that's putting on the banquet. I said, Sir, the holy word of God declares, Give honor to whom honor is due. And I would be so honored if you would take this. Woo! People were clapping, shouting. I'm going, glory to God. You know. I thought they was going, give me the key to the city, you know. Yeah, this close to monkey. But see? Yeah. You go, oh, suck it up and be a man. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So what do you do? A good guy. Give him, you know, shoot, make it look good. Remember possibilities. Okay, y'all are going to blend together and have a lot of uh, creative stuff, okay? You'll put him in the best light, okay? Which means yes. Okay, good. That's right. All right. What do you do? Do what? The North Campus. See, I told you, that's that expanding we're talking about. So just set it on fire, okay? Just so that's what we got to do. We can't apologize for nearly saying something. I don't like these preachers that mumble and apologize for nearly saying something. You ought to say what you believe and believe what you say, or sit down. Don't you think? Thank you, Dad. Yeah, God's not near through with you. Psalms 146 says, "One generation will spend the rest of their time lauding and applauding the mighty deeds of God, convincing the coming generation God's everything He says He is." So there ain't no such thing as retiring. You refire, okay? Don't give in, don't give up. That's right. I'll guarantee you, you can't outrun him, so run with him, okay? You can't outrun him, just run with him. How old are you? Sixteen, that's good. That's in jail by your time. So, <laughs> see? So God's got, God's got a plan for you. Read Jeremiah 29, 11 when you get home, okay? And he says, I know my thoughts. I think towards you. See, the devil goes, boy, you're so insignificant. God don't even think about you. He's lying to you. God thinks continually about you good things. That's what it says. we got to get out of here, Pastor. It's getting late. You do know I can put a rear naked choke on anybody in here. You ever, had, you ever been choked out? I choked a musician out on television. You know, remember? Oh, oh Swanson, you were there. And he turned, you know, he, he, he turned his pink as you know, bless his heart. But, uh, yeah, but this guy goes, rear naked choke. That's not a movie. It's a, it's a martial art thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up really different, boy. I hit my brother in the head with a hammer. You know, my brother could whip me with his fist, and we was building my mother a, a porch, and I may have lipped off a little bit, you know. And he swung me around, and he started hitting me, but I had a hammer, so I hit him in the head, and the hammer stuck in his head. What? Yes, the hammer stuck in his head. You got a hole in your head right there, your sinus. That's where the hammer head went. Handle sticking out that way. My mother opened the door and go, ah, you've killed him. I said, shut up. I know that. But it didn't. The doctor said it's a miracle. Said if you'd hit him there, you'd kill him. If you hit him there, you'd kill him. But I hit him right in the right space. It went in there. There's a hole in your head. See? But from, you know, he always had a little half moon with a hammer. But see, we grew up rough. I got wounds. 
and we, I got a wound. You can't see it for the watch band. It cut right there. And every time my heart would beat, my blood would hit up on the ceiling. And we just sat there until I fell out. Just bled out. Nobody put a tourniquet or Band-Aid or no. And they cut that thing right there. My brother's trying to stab me with a knife. Not to do it like that. And they cut this thing. Gee, he's bleeding. Well, but anyway, it's a miracle we made it. But I look back now and I realize it was training for raining. What do you do? Heck, oh boy. My little grandson, he's nine, and he gets so mad at me. He's got one of these race cars, you know, and I run it in the ditch, you know, and he, turn, you know. But I don't know all that technology. Do you? It's, it's Greek or something to me. I hate to mess with it, you know, with the media and stuff, but you know, I got some things called Bobby's briefings. I came out with Bobby's briefs, and they go, "No," you know. <laughs> so I had to change it to Bobby's briefings, you know. That's good. I know. You, you go. He ain't got any better, you know. No, I want you to know something. I'm happy. There's so many sad. Listen, get a grip. We live in America. There's people give. The whole life to get to live like we live. And God's been good to us. I know we're in trouble. But listen, we got a good God. And God's going to finish what he started. And we get one nation under God. How you doing? Good. God bless you. It's okay. Listen, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Somebody's going to find the stem of an aquatic plant, and in that stem of that aquatic plant, there's going to be a derivative made that will reverse Alzheimer's and dementia. So somebody get to, get to work on it. It's uh, inside an aquatic plant, the stem of it, not the leaves, and it'll be a substance that they can um, make it into a, a medicine, and it'll reverse Alzheimer's and dementia. But you're not finished, okay? Yeah. That's right, you're not finished. Look at that. Sharper's attack. That's right. Yeah. Okay. He goes, oh, no. Too late for that. What do you do? Take a guess. You'll get it right. <laughs> How to be a, a son? That's a lifetime job. Okay? But be it. You know, because one day you'll be standing there. Y'all ought, ought to hear my birth story, not my, me. My wife was, you know, pregnant, and we'd gone through all that stuff before you practice and all that, and we had our little suitcase together. You ready? And it's Christmas. We're eating at their, her mother's house, and she goes, oh, Bobby, I think I'm in labor. No! Because she had bought me a, a Target pistol to shoot rats, and I want to go to the dump and shoot rats, and she's going, oh! And I thought, no, she couldn't be. It's not quite time. But we had made our plan. You get the luggage and you go to the hospital. So I go rat shooting and I shoot a bunch of rats and I got, had a lot of fun. Then I go, good Lord, I've been here a long time. So I took off to the house and I was expecting to find Carolyn maybe over the sink washing up some dishes. I find her. She's in the recliner. Full blown! Ah! Ah! I panicked. Now, I'm just going to be straight out honest with you. I went nuts. I grabbed the, the bag, ran to the door, slammed the door, slammed the door through my hand. The dead boat had me impaled on the door. I'm bleeding like a stuck hog. And Carolyn's over there going, settle down. And blood's just, that's, you see the scar. The dead boat, when I slammed the door, and I left her in there. I've got the luggage. She's out there, and I'm holding. She had to wrap my arm, arm, hand up in a towel. We get to the hospital. I know y'all got to go, but listen. We get to the hospital. And she gets out of the car, and they put her on a gurney. The nurse was an old military nurse. Sound like a horse walking on a bridge. She goes over there, and then she pulls the cover off of my wife, and she goes, oh, my God. You don't tell a guy like me, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And they took Carolyn off. The gurney. Left me standing there like a stupid dog. And 
and I said, I've had enough of this. The next person walks by here, I'm getting me some answers. My doctor came by there, I threw him up against the wall in a chokehold, and I said, all right, what happened? He said, they didn't tell you? See, I thought, uh-huh, they've got her back there, let something happen to her, and hadn't got guts enough to tell me. But see, I had him in a chokehold. He said, they didn't tell you? I said, no. I said, she gave birth the moment she got back there. I've been over there sweating bullets. They'll call the cops on if you hold a doctor up here, you, you know. But anyway, Yorda went with me to the grocery store to buy the first stuff. She gave me a thing after we got the boy home. She gave me a, a, a shopping list. So I go to a store, and I said to this lady, ma'am, I need to get a case of shellac. She said, what you painting? I ain't painting nothing. We've got a new son. She said, you mean Similac. Not shellac. See? See? You think you've had problems. Yeah. 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 I was trying to buy a case of shellac. Oh, Lord. I better get out of here. See? The Lord said, you amuse me, boy. See? He'll talk. He stood in front of me. Then. Now, don't, the Lord stood in front of me, and he took his finger and did just like that. And he did like that again. Then he said, Bobby, do you know what a printed word is? I said to him, apparently not. He said, it's a thought you can see. Now, that's profound, isn't it? God writes his thoughts in a book, and you can see it. So we're headed to the book table in a moment. And so we've got people healed of liver disease, sleep dis dysfunction. And so there's other things. All you've got to do is ask him. He's a very present help. He's not out there on vacation. He doesn't slumber nor sleep. Isn't that something? So we're getting ready. Right? So what do you do? You, huh? I said, what do you do? Oh, are you? Uh -huh. Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> Offerings a little slack? No. <laughs> no, no. Oh boy, my mom used to make her clothes. I got a different. I can remember when they took a picture of me in a dress. They do, used to dress the little babies. I can tell you everything happened. Now, I've got the mom. It's crazy, isn't it? Well, I'm, I'm getting ready to go. Y'all ready to go? i got to go to the airport sometimes this week, fly somewhere to do something. But it's a great time to be alive, isn't it? People are desperate now, and they need answers. And it doesn't hurt to laugh. A merry heart does good like a... Yeah, that's right. Well, and you know, one thing that's a canker in the church is unforgiveness. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Whatever they did to you can't be what we did to Jesus. And he says, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgave us. So anyway, I'll be with us. I don't know how you get to the book table. You go through that away and you turn this away. It's good. We speak well known. I go all over the world. They never ask me to sing. I don't know. I sing. When I sing, I was, Okay, when I sing, I sing like Louis Armstrong. Hello, darling, you're looking swell. See? Now, that's a dead ringer for Louis. Don't you think? The kids are going, oh, please, Dad, take the mic. Bobby Connor, everyone, come on, let's give a big thank you tonight. Bobby, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. That was so good. That was so great. And you'll come back tomorrow and tomorrow morning. That'll be good. Uh, you're in the morning. Yeah, yeah. We'll have some maple bars for you. And, all right. Yeah. Let's start early. All right. Uh, hey, guys, thanks for being here. Uh, we'll be back in the morning at uh, 10 a.m. Have a good night.